investors sitting at home around the world right now, they're in kind of that 2010 to 2020 portfolio. That disinflation, that austerity world, because that worked for a long, long time. It worked really, really, really well, right? But what we're trying to point out and what I'm hearing from professional investors around the world more and more is that we're really heading for a 2020 to 2030 portfolio that looks entirely different. Larry McDonald, founder of the Bear Traps Report and author of the new book, How to Listen When Markets Speak, Risk, Myths, and Investment Opportunities in a Radically Reshaped Economy. Larry, it is so great to welcome you back to the show and congratulations on what is truly an incredible book. I loved it so much. It's great to have you on. Uh, thank you, Julia. It's been a, a journey, lots of ups and downs, and you know, you've got to break through those walls and there's a lot of stories we can get into, but it, you know, it's climbing the mountains, a lot of fun. And I, I just, you know, I want to say thank you to everybody and thank you to you. And then, and, and just, uh, you know, we're, we're just going to finish this one off. It's the first couple of weeks, but we'll see. Um, we're hoping for an, an, another New York Times bestseller. Well, I really loved it. And I did the audio version of it, which was such a delight, especially accompanying company on my morning runs. I love the dialogue, just an incredible listen, an incredible read as well. I want to start, Larry, where I always start with my guests, and I'm going to kind of reframe the question, but I always ask for my guests for their big picture macro outlook framework framework in which they're looking at the world today. And one of the things that caught my attention reading the book was Neil, Neil Ferguson in the opening talked about what you've painted here is the financial equivalent of a fourth turning, which is a topic we have discussed at length on this show. So I want to get the macro picture for you today and where we're headed. And one of the things, Larry, is take all the time you need to set the table, if you will. Okay. Well, first, you know, for us, the, the words that I try to live by since I was probably 18 or 19, uh, you know, it comes down to you can get everything in life that you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. And so when the first book came out, I was a trader at Lehman it did really well. So we did a lot of speeches around the world. We did about a, one, one thing I learned on a New York Times bestseller, you make much more money on the speaking tour than you do writing the book. <laughs> and, and, and it was, but the best part is the people that you meet. And so we built this, a Bloomberg chat behind us where we have these relationships around the world, hedge fund, professional investors. So hedge fund managers, pension fund managers, mutual fund managers, and like high net worth family offices. And so what, we, what we've created is like an incubation tool where, um, let's just say there's 600 people in a theater. Uh, most people won't, most people will sit in the seats and observe the conversation. But what I try to do is we have 30 or 40 people that are veteran investors that have been on the buy side. That means they they run money professionally. And we have that conversation. It's like a live ideas dinner. Uh, and we do it pretty much every day uh, throughout the year, business day. And so- when markets speak, we're really trying to democratize information that gives something back, you know, helping others. And we're trying to give the reader a kind of a lens on like what are the professionals really thinking, you know, how are trends shifting where, you know, say, say, say it's nine months, a year ago, people thought one way. And, and now as we look down the road ahead as to what's happening, you know, what's really happening looking out the next five years. And, and that, that's the kind of the premise of the book. But in terms of in terms of the the, the road ahead, um, it all starts with kind of the, I guess going back to Lehman. The the Lehman crash uh, created what's called a, a fiscal and monetary response of about four trillion dollars of fiscal and monetary. And after that, you know, in Greece and in the United States, there was a pretty violent austerity regime that came in with the Tea Party and. Germany, their pressure on Greece, their pressure on Portugal, the pressure pressure on Italy, and there was this amazing global austerity regime between, say, 2010, uh, tw- 11, 12 into like 16, uh, and then we had Brexit. So that was a massive, like, disinflationary force. So the if you think of the post-COVID world, the post-COVID world where the Europeans are working uh, much better together in terms of their almost anti-austerity. Just look at, look at this week, look at the Italian budget, look at the French budget. So Europe's got anti-austerity 
And in the United States, when you talk to people around the Hill, we spend a lot of time on the Hill with our partner, ACG Analytics, and we talk to senators and congressmen. There's literally not an ounce, I mean, not it, 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 literally not an ounce of austerity will on the Hill. It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. It's like going, it's like Mars versus Venus 10 years ago. So, so let's go back. The Lehman fiscal and monetary response was $4 trillion. The COVID fiscal and monetary response is $16 trillion, okay, to this day. Until you're talking about the event and then the post three years after, three, four years after. And so for investors sitting at home around the world right now, they're in kind of that 2010 to 2020 portfolio that disinflation, that austerity world, because that worked for a long, long time. It worked really, really, really well, right? But what we're trying to point out and what I'm hearing from professional investors around the world more and more is that we're really heading for a 2020 to 2030 portfolio that looks entirely different. Let's talk about that, how it looks different, because what I'm hearing from you is a lot of folks aren't ready. They're not prepared for that. Their their portfolios look like, as he pointed out, the 2010 to 2020, a very different macro regime. Yes, and so let's just take let's just take the Rust Belt. Um, we've taken five million jobs out of the Rust Belt. We've moved them around the world. We've increased the standard of living globally, and but because we've decimated the Rust Belt. Uh, fathers are coming home uh, that, that where they're, imagine if you worked in, in an auto plant in the Midwest and your father and your great grandfather and your, and your entire family lineage worked in that auto plant. And now you're, you're in a services industry or you're in a much lower paying job. And so, so it's a massive opioid crisis in, in many parts of the working uh, class states in America. And that created a big shift. We, we know that Trump and, and Biden have both shifted toward reshoring now. You know, for, for decades, the Republicans and the Democrats talk, talked about, oh, you know, the power of an export economy, the power of free trade. And so what we talk about in the book is that's all reversing. So all these secular um, kind of disinflationary forces, you may think about the power of um, supply chains. So. When we talk about in the book, um, I sat down with Andreas Stepp as a billionaire investor in Brazil, brilliant guy. And he said, Larry, supply chains, because we're now in a multipolar world, uh, everything we knew before in terms of free trade, in terms of exporting jobs, the politics of that is reversing, number one. But in the post-COVID world, it's multipolar. What that means is there's more global conflicts. It's more like a 1960s to 1980s world. You know, right now we got drone attacks on Russian oil refineries. Right now we have drone attacks on on ships in the Suez Canal. You can't literally cannot get an LNG shipment through that canal. It's just too dangerous. That's a multipolar world. It's totally different on it has a totally different impact on inflation. And when we and then we, when we've exported these jobs around the world, we've increased the standard of living dramatically in India, Bangladesh, China, they're consuming carbon at a much higher rate. And so that's putting these tremendous forces and pressures on metals, oil and gas, and and that's creating a much more sustained inflation regime. And that's part of what's kicking off this kind of great migration into a totally different group of asset, totally different part of asset class management or portfolio construction. Yeah. You know what I love about the book is you have these conversations with these players, a lot of names that are really familiar. And uh, you were just mentioning Andre Estevez. And I wrote down one of the lines that he said to you is there's always been a strong connection between geopolitical tensions and inflation. So what I'm hearing for you from you is like we're moving into an inflationary regime. So uh, tease that out a bit more because it sounds like that's going to be a more persistent problem going forward. And maybe the Fed's fight against inflation, it's maybe it's going to be moot. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Well, remember, we have a $35 trillion debt. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, depending on who you talk to, 190 to $210 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Those are promises to postal workers. Those are promises to, to people in our military pensions. Those are promises to Medicare, Medicaid, you can go on and on and on. So, when you have that type of debt load and you've got an aging population in the United States, the boomers now, they control 78 trillion of wealth. 
the oldest boomer is now about 78 years old. And so you're coming into a period where the only way out of this death hole is to monitor, is to, there's two ways. It's what's called a debt jubilee, which we've looked back, you can look back to the Bible as we do in the book. And there are many civilizations that just did a reset where you, you know, reset and it's just basically, basically it's a massive sovereign default. And which we've seen, we've seen quite a few times in Argentina, right? They're, they do the key jet debt jubilee resets all the time. Um, so in the history of capitalism, Ips history, um, modern global economics and, and politics, the, the debt jubilee has is, is been very common. The other way out of this is, is what we call financial oppression. That's to monetize the debt. And that's where even though the central bankers and the politicians pretend that they want to get inflation down, we argue in the books, say secretly want a much higher in level of inflation because if you can keep, if you can somehow keep interest rates through all kinds of different tricks in Washington, if you can keep them below the rate of inflation, so interest rates here or inflation, interest rates here, inflation here, then you could actually, it's complicated, but you can monetize the debt that way and get out of the debt load. And so that's really what they're trying to do on, on the Hill. And that's why when you listen to the Fed governors, uh, we predict with the, within the next year and a half, two years, they're going to move from a 2% inflation target to a 3% inflation target. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support and enjoy the rest of the interview. Okay, and you also wrote this, and I wrote this line down. This is the most important line in the book. It's not what you said. If inflation normalizes in this cycle at three to four percent instead of the one to two percent as in previous decades, trillions of dollars are misallocated across the investment asset ecosystem as portfolios are still massively overweight growth stocks. I want to hear more on this misallocation, trillions of dollars. What are the implications here? Can you? Let, let's flush this idea out. This is interesting to me. Okay. So I, I sat down with David Einhorn, Greenlight Capital. He's probably, uh, he's my favorite value investor in the modern era. I mean, people, he's like Buffett, but with a long, short strategy. Mm -hmm. So he's value, but he also takes strategic bets against overvalued companies as well. It's called Greenlight Capital, David Einhorn. Uh, just a Hall of Fame, first Fooling ballot Fooling some people of all of the time, that, that great book he wrote too. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Fooling some of the people all the time. It's it's a great book. It's it's a must read. Fooling some of the people all the time by David Einhorn. And so what what he talks about is in a, in, in a, in a sustained inflation regime, there's different types of, of stocks that work. Whereas in a disinflation regime, uh, long duration equities work. But what that means is Think, think of like ARC or cloud computing. Look at those stocks now. It's it's really remarkable because even though some growth stocks are doing very well, you know, your your app, your well, I should say Apple, Apple and Tesla are doing poorly now. But you know, the Fangs and, and some of the you know big tech stocks are doing fine. But if you look under the surface, because inflation is starting to normalize at a higher plane, your ARC names, your Renaissance IPO, your cloud, your long duration equities, and those are companies that reinvest capital, um, the, the longer, if inflation normalizes at a higher path, if you if you have free cash flow that comes into a company and it stays in the company, um, over time in an inflationary regime, and if you don't hold strategic assets, that capital over time, your cash flow, because you're producing the cash flow over say five or 10 years, because of inflation, that cash flow is worth less and less and less and less over time. And those are what we call long duration growth stocks. And so that's the first leading indicator. We have to, you know, like the book says, we have to listen when markets speak. Right now, long duration growth stocks in 2022 and right now are dramatically underperforming the S&P. And so that's telling you that something's going on. Now, what type of companies do well? I mean, when you listen to people like Einhorn, um, he has been positioned in, 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 in um, copper names tech resources. Think of like a, a company like Tech Resources Al or Alcoa or Freeport Macaran or Chevron. They own strategic assets all around the world. They own assets. 
Um, think about natural gas companies like Antero is a, is a name that we've, we've been looking at Gary very carefully. We, we own in our high conviction portfolio with the beer draft support. Antero, Southwest Energy, they own tons of natural gas assets underground and they're producing natural gas. So in an inflationary regime, if inflation normalizes at a higher trajectory, companies that own hard assets, uh, companies that produce cash flow uh, yields, very attractive value plays, do much better than, than many of the growth long duration stocks. So there's different types of stocks. There's growth stocks, there's value stocks, and then there's long, long duration growth stocks like the ARC names and things like that. And so as inflation is kind of creeping up here in a, in a multipolar world, as Andrea Stephas says, for a lot of reasons, we have a power of labor, labor unions are more powerful than ever. We've got all of these tailwinds towards sustained inflation. And so you really want to be in a totally different basket of companies now versus, and that's that's what David Einhorn's saying. Let me ask you this too, because how much does like recency bias affect how investors are allocated? Um, you know, because for the last year or so, the or I mean, probably even longer, the talk was all about the Magnificent Seven. Now it's kind of the fat, I think the Fantastic Four is how it's being referenced. But how much does that matter? Because it's like, well, maybe that's what worked and they might not see the opportunity to shift. Like, I would love to explore that. Well, one of the things I talked about in, in both of my books, when, when I was in the 90s, I was fortunate enough to create ConvertPlan.com. So I lived through the 90s. We were blessed. We were fortunate really fortunate to sell it to Morgan Stanley in October of 99. So I lived through this personally and I saw this attraction to recency bias to uh, the obvious traits. And so back then, whenever you have kind of a new industrial re revolution, think of the internet. Um, and now today you think of artificial intelligence. It's very similar, very similar. You've got uh, a new boom, a new revolution, a new, new industrial re revolution, you can say, where people are trying to pile in to the most attractive investments. And what happens is in the, in the 90s, everybody piled into Global Crossing. They piled into Lucent Technologies, JDS Uniphase, Cisco, and these kind of like big infrastructure plays that looked very, very obvious. But if you think about the internet, it really is the build out of a colossal infrastructure of, of communication, right? A tentacles. And there were all these other companies like Match.com, you know, dating. Uh, you could you could go into companies like Netflix that, with that bandwidth of the internet, Netflix, Facebook. All these other companies were actually the 10, 20, 90 baggers, as, as Peter Lynch likes to talk about. In other words, you make 10, 20, you know, 50 times on your money on these on these trades that didn't really look that obvious. And it's the same situation today. Like with artificial intelligence, everybody's looking at NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA is now trading 80, to, in the last couple of weeks, it's trading 80% above its 200-day moving average, right? To, at, at, at a, at a $2.3 trillion valuation. I want you to think about this. A $2.3 trillion valuation, right? And it's trading, it, it got literally within, it got very close to Apple's valuation. And it was trading 83% above its 200-day moving average. The best Apple ever got, right, in the history of Apple, uh, when it was at that $2 trillion valuation, it got about 64%, 63% above its 200-day moving average. The best Amazon ever got when it got close to $2 trillion, the best on its best day. And think about this Amazon now, right? This is a uh, you know, one of the most popular growth stocks of all time. It got 54, 55% above its 200 day moving average. So this speaks to the colossal distortion of capital in the market. Everybody is just piled into the same trade. And at the end of the day, we argue in the book that the data center usage, if you believe in video management, if you believe the artificial intelligence projections from Wall Street in terms of total data centers, total chips. If you believe that fantasy, let's just say we do, how are we going to power it? Um, we have a grid in the United States, a power grid that's 50 years old in some places. It's 30, 30 years old in others. Um, it's going to take a $2 trillion rebuild. It's going to take tons of copper, tons of aluminum. That's where the trades are. And then if you look at getting power, just natural gas, Antero, 
um, all different types of the SCG, which is a portfolio of natural gas companies that are going to, you know, natural gas is trading below $2 now. If you believe in video management, natural gas uh, probably belongs six, seven, eight dollars. You can play that through different ways through the commodity or the equities. And that's, it's always like those second, third level of trades uh, that, that are behind the scenes. That's where the opportunities are. Okay. So I want to hear more on that, on the opportunities. Opportunities, it sounds like those parts of the market, they're underpriced right now or early innings. Can you flesh that out? And how much does it matter about like the projections of like, you know, the like NVIDIA, for example, for those kinds of trades? Well, think of data center usage, right? So in 2022, it was about 460 terawatt hours. Um, and what the projections are, if you just listed a different consultants, we've talked to lots of consultants, we've talked to lots of different hedge funds. We're, we're, you know, we're trying to triangulate information. We're trying to take a piece of information, a projection, and surround it with other pieces of information from other professionals. And we, we, we hear estimates upwards of um, 2,000 terawatt hours by, uh, say, 2027, 20, 26, 27, 28. So you're talking about a massive explosion of energy consumption. And on top of that, a ton of electric vehicles that if you look at the green new, you know, the green new deal or the origin origins of it or the projections from Tesla, if you look at all that, we're talking about we got to put a lot of electric vehicles on this aging power grid. Um, and on top of that, one thing we're a lot of people are talking about behind me in the chat right now in Washington is the Ukraine rebuild because the the amount of copper and and and, and commodities it's going to take to rebuild the Ukraine as we this war I think is probably over within the next. Uh, nine months to a year, and then we're going to be rebuilding the Ukraine. So all of this is coming to a head in like 2026, 27, 28. We're talking about a colossal uh, potential energy commodity crisis. We're headed for it. Like, I want to hear more on that and what that could mean for energy prices, energy stocks, if we're headed toward that colossal energy crisis. Well, let's go back to um, what we talked about before. You know, the Davos crowd, they mean well. You know, they if you listen... This is like unintended consequences from oh, what I call idiot savants, right? There's a lot of smart people in the world, but they're interconnected. They don't really connect the dots, right? And so if you think about projections on electric vehicles, on ESG, so the Davos crowd essentially has suppressed the supply of commodities through regulation and ESG, no question. Also, because of the last commodity bull market kind of blew up in 2016, a lot of CFOs across the country and the world, a lot of chief financial officers in the commodity space. If you if you if you're a chief financial officer in a natural gas company in the, say the Southwest, and you just watched your previous three bosses get shot because they overinvested, you know they get shot when everybody you know kind of fired, you're going to have a totally different capital discipline. And so we've had this massive colossal suppression of supply of investment. So if you take the investment path from 2010 to 2014, the way we were going across gas, oil, uranium, you know, all the different important key commodities to support all these projections. If you take that growth path from 2010 to 2014, we're essentially in a $3 trillion capital investment hole that's going to have to be filled. So that's across uranium, that's across, you know, for nuclear power, that's across copper you know, and, and aluminum for the grid, that's across oil and gas. And so we're $3 trillion in the hole. But if you look at the global population from 2014 to 2024, 2014 to 2024, 10 years, we're up almost a billion human beings, <laughs> Julia, a billion human beings. One billion. Uh, so, and, and guess what? Because the Davos crowd wanted to globalize, right? And because we took those five million jobs out of the United States, we made people in B Bangladesh a lot richer. We made people in India a lot richer. And so, we've raised. If you're if you're working at a call center in India, you're making like you know, 10, 50, 100 times more than your great great grandparents, right? Because you're you've got. You're, and so, the, and guess what? There's a billion people in India that don't have air conditioning. There's 150 million people in India that have no electricity at all. So as you raise the standard of living in fast carbon consuming countries, and these, 
I mean, the carbon consumption growth in India is like eight times that what it is in, say, you know, Canada or 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 you know, say the United Kingdom. And there's 1.4 billion people in India. I mean, this is the most colossal cluster, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's and that's what's setting up for this real energy crisis in say 2020. 25, six, seven. It's coming at us right now. Right now, today, look at Brent. You no, know, look at look at copper. Um, commodities are really starting to move. Where do you think where do you think the price of oil could be headed? Do you have a projection there? Well, I mean, think about the last time. See, right now the global economy is moving along pretty well. The last time Japanese stocks and French stocks and Italian stocks were this strong. And that's those are, you know, kind of strange markets that you know, typically those aren't your, your your best markets for equities. You know, but they're they've been near all time multi year highs, uh, and their economies are bouncing. And so, the last time those markets were this strong in equities as they have been over the last couple of months, uh, oil was one hundred and forty dollars a barrel. And so, I, I think that we could be two hundred dollars a barrel. I think that we we've underinvested. I think that because of regulation. Now, if Trump, you know, now we want to start thinking about Trump trades, right? If Trump does get in the office, he's going to open up exploration again. So one of the things the clients are talking about in the chat, in the chat, and so we have institutional clients behind us, they're talking about Rig and Schlumberger or the OIH ETF. That's those are companies that are going to basically start to rebuild this infrastructure that we need to really catch up in the 20, 21st century because of all this demand that's coming up. So if you think about the grid, that's one thing. We can get into those those days, which we've gone into a little bit. Um, and then, but if you think about oil and gas, to that kind of rebuild, it's going to be really oil services. And so, if oil's up at anywhere above, say, one hundred and twenty to two hundred dollars a barrel. The oil service sector, those equities are going to be a lot, lot higher from here. Mm, got it. Okay, so there's definitely a trade there. Um, before I, I let you go, we have a few minutes left. Let me tick through some areas that could be of interest with this audience. I know you wrote about Bitcoin and crypto and the bubbles in the book. I, I want to get your update on Bitcoin, the price movement we have seen this year. I also want to throw in this kind of separate topic, but I want to make sure we cover it. Gold and silver. Those are topics that keep coming up in the comment section. So let's start with Bitcoin and then we can go to the precious metals. Okay. So Bitcoin is a big part of the book and it's a big, I believe in the Bitcoin thesis, the sales pitch, um, they mean well. Unfortunately, you have a lot of cheerleading at the highs and crickets at the lows, right? And it's sinful. Uh, Bitcoin and crypto have hurt many young investors. And people get way too excited when it's at the highs. You hear all these projections of, you know, incredible targets of $100,000 Bitcoin. Fine. But at the lows, it's crickets, crickets, crickets. Michael Saylor, we need you to tweet more at the lows, not at the highs, okay? Um, Bitcoin has, since 2017, Bitcoin has four drawdowns of 60 to 82%, okay? So what the cheerleaders will do, they'll say, well, if you've owned Bitcoin from 2010 to now, you would have you know X billions of dollars. Yeah, this is the biggest pile of BS on the planet Earth because just think about any young person. Let's just say some person, younger person, hits it with Bitcoin, right? You get a million bucks. You're, say, 30 years old. You want to get married. You want to buy a house, right? All of a sudden, your, your million bucks inside of, five, inside of like five years goes from a million to 200,000, right? As it did from 2007. That first drawdown was 82%. So it's 2007. So your million bucks went from a million to 200,000. A million. We've gone back and forth. It's up a little bit over. I mean, it's, it's up over the last like, I guess since the last couple of years, it's up a little bit. But it's really not that up that much because it had another seventy percent drawdown. Right, gold's our largest drawdown since two thousand is forty five percent. Gold's largest drawdown since two thousand fifteen is about twenty twenty one percent. That's a store of value. That's a historical fact. You could put a million dollars in gold and sleep at night. You can't put a million dollars in something that drops 60 to 80 percent four times in five and a half, six years. It's just, it just doesn't work. And no human being can withstand that kind of volatility. Now, you can do it with small amounts of capital. If you have an insignificant amount of capital, $10,000, $20,000, and you're 
you're worth a million, whatever it is, you can just put that Bitcoin away, it can bounce around, that's great. But let's talk about a store of value. Now, when it comes to um, metals and oil and gas, let's just think about one last important fact. The NASDAQ 100 today, and you think about oil and gas and metals and, and versus say the NASDAQ 100. The NASDAQ 100 has $22 trillion of valuation. So the entire American 401k system, everybody's 401k has been hijacked by like 12 stocks, right? And so this is a pretty scary thing because nobody owns oil and gas. The oil and gas names are like 3% of the S&P. NVIDIA alone is 5% of the S&P, right? So, and the metals, it's even more of a joke. Um, the entire precious metal and uranium sectors combined is less than $300 billion. If you take all the uranium companies that are going to produce all this, uh, that are basically going to power the entire nuclear power transition for the green revolution, the, all those all those uranium companies that, that are on earth and all these gold and silver miners on earth, if you add them all up, it's like 280 to $290 billion, right? It's a joke. It's literally a bathroom rounding era at NVIDIA. Like there's, you know, it's just an absolute joke. And so everybody's piled into um, what we call financial assets. Meanwhile, the Russians and the Chinese are backing up the truck strategically the last five, to seven years on hard assets, on real assets, materials, metals, oil, and gas. And that's why, you know, I think that you, you've got a tremendous opportunity looking at reallocating your portfolio into a high, comp higher component of say, instead of, Instead of risk parity, as we talk about 60-40, which is 60% stocks, 40% bonds, the new risk parity is going to be something like 40% stocks, 40% bonds, and 20% commodities. Fascinating. Larry, I really enjoyed your book. I loved listening to the audio version as well. I loved listening to you today. I want to give you the final few moments here to let folks know, um, you know more about your work. Obviously, pick up a copy of the book. Any parting thoughts, anything that you want to leave with this audience to think about, the floor is yours. Well, at first, I just want to thank so many of the contributors in the book that that made this happen. And and like I said, it's about bringing a good group together. I mean, Larry McDonald, I'm not, I'm not some billionaire investor, but I am a person that has built wealth by working with other people and triangulating information. So if you take one piece of your information, like I said, and you surround it with lots of talent, and you nurture it and you work really hard on trying to ask the right questions, you know, have a collection of confidants that can make you stronger and more passionate every single day. And we all have that time in life. And I just want, you know, to put this book together, we, 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 we created a New York Times bestseller in the first book. It was rated by the CFA Institute as the top 20 all time. It's called Colossal Player of Common Sense. So imagine we have this great book. Then we go to the publisher in the last five years and they reject us on, on a couple of book ideas. And I tell you, the, the team at Random House Penguin came together with our, our agent, Jim Levine, and we really put together an amazing team of, of, of confidants, of intellectual capital to put this book together. And I'm, I'm grateful to everyone. And like, there's no I in team. You got to break through walls. You got to make things happen. And, and thanks very much for for taking the time. And you can find us uh, at thebeartrapsreport.com. You can find us on Twitter at ConvertBond. Well, 10 out of 10 would recommend five-star review from me, Larry McDonald, founder of the Bear Traps Report and author of How to Listen When Markets Speak. It is great seeing you, my friend. Really appreciate you taking the time and congratulations. Thanks, Julia.